week. I hope everybody's had a good week. We've been really busy, but that's all right. Um, life is good when it's busy. Got stuff going. Um, we want to start with a little prayer. Does, um, does anyone have anything or anyone you want to put on the board here? Let's continue to pray for Dave, Dave Rice, his family, um, and the Williams, and the Williams family, and the Williams family, and Joe, and Joe, yeah, and Joe. Okay. Anyone else? Is Adanya still traveling? Okay, she's still. She'll be heading home soon, won't she? Uh, she's got another week. What, another yeah. week. Ago. Wow, what a world traveler! <laughs> that was that was uh, Tensi. She was a world traveler for a long time. She went around the world a bunch of times. That's awesome. Well, I've been to eighty-six countries in the world. Eighty-six <laughs> countries. Some of them four or five. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. I couldn't find one. So finally last week I was talking to somebody that was sitting here about, do you know if there's a Spanish uh, church around? She said, there's one in Black Mountain. I said, oh, tell me where it is. She says, I'll take you. So we did. It was about, I would say 75, 80 people there, members. It was very, very nice. So I sat next to a gentleman and I asked him, where can I get a Spanish Bible like yours? He says, I'll be right back. So he goes and he brings me two. Oh. Ah. And I go, I can't believe it. I promised that little orphan boy when I took him to the hospital and spent the night with him at the hospital. I couldn't say not to, nothing much to him because he doesn't know his birthday, he doesn't know his parents or nothing. Wow. So I said, Lord, you, you know, I'm here with this child. What, is, what shall I say to him? So I said, uh, finally, I said, uh, if there were three things you would like, what would they be? He says, I would like to have my own Spanish Bible. Wow. This little kid is like nine years old. Wow. Or, you know, and it was the second thing, and he says, a watch. Oh, so I'm taking my watch off. He says, no, I'd like to have a man's watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I said, what's the third thing? He says, I'd like to have my own bike. If you have your own bike, that means you have your own car. You can get anywhere, so yeah. I couldn't get that either. So Dr. Uh, Hill came in to look for me at the hospital because I stayed overnight with the little boy in the hospital. And uh, he says, I need you, Tensi. Where are you? Where are you? And I says, I'm here with him. I said, but what time do you have? And he says, well... I said, can you take it off? Let me see it. So he took it off, and I said, you just gave it to this little boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, what if it would have been a Rolex? Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I gave it to him, and I said, that's the only thing I could get him out of the three things. And I said, but I will be sending you a Bible. Well, I couldn't find one until last Sabbath. So I'm thanking the Lord, because the group is leaving, I think, the seventh. Okay. Right? And I'm giving them one for the orphanage and one for the little boy. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh. yeah. What a great story. After three years. <laughs> looking for a Spanish Bible. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> All right. So thank well, good. You, Lord. well, that's great. Good, good. All right, well, let's start with prayer. Father, we are again grateful for a beautiful Sabbath morning, for the opportunity to be here and open your word and to um, start a new, a new quarter here. And uh, we're looking forward to what you have to say, for us, say to us. Um, we have um, dear friends on the board who have lost so much, uh, Dave Rice, Joe Boone, and the Williams family, Lord, we pray, and uh, Ed Maggard also lost his mom. We pray, Lord, that you will, um, you will be close to all these folks, um, bring them hope and, um, and peace and assurance of, of your um, plans for the future um, for all of us, um, that you're going to bring us all back together with Jesus on that great day, and we can't wait, Lord, so do make that happen soon. Um, be with our kids wherever they are. Bless them. Watch over them, Lord. Draw them closer to you um, and to each other. May we, um, we've been so blessed by our children, and we just pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless them. Um, and just be with our church today, Lord. Just, just send your Holy Spirit here today as we, um, we come to gather together and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> So the new chapter, uh, the new quarter, is in the crucible with Christ. So I need to know a definition of crucible so we know what we're talking about. Container? It's a container. Good. 
heat is involved. Yeah, the, the image we have on the, on the cover here is, a, uh, is at a, a metal factory where they're heating metal to pour it into a mold. Um, and uh, the crucible. Any other any other thoughts of the word crucible? Maybe creation. Creation. Okay. Creation. Yeah, we're creating something, pouring something new. But in order for that to happen, in order for this to happen, at least the picture here, whatever's being made new has to be. The word was used. Heated. heated. Well, heated first. Yeah. So there's some there's some there's some heat going on, right? There's some, there's some pressure, there's some, some distress, there's some anxiety maybe. There's all kinds of things that happen in a crucible. And when we think of a crucible for our own lives, it's, uh, it's, we, we find ourselves in tough situations quite frequently. Um, you know, some people end up with illnesses that are very difficult. We, we have dear friends that have lost so, many, so much of their families that that is very difficult um, we have things in life that change you know we move from one place to another we uh, we my son and his family are moving to Houston and and Carolyn has moved and, and that's an upheaval you know that's a that's that causes some anxiety um, there's all kinds of things I guess in life that can be that can be really difficult and I guess that's kind of where, where this lesson is going to go this, this quarter is, is, is how do we get through this stuff? How do we get through the, the troubles in life and these crucibles that we find ourselves? Yeah, Bob. Yeah, it makes me just, uh, just talking about this, it makes me think of uh, the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White saying, our only problem is if we forget how God has led us in the past. So when we face these things, it would be good if we had some look in the rearview mirror and see how he led in the past. Good, yeah. Because we're going more down the road. Because we're going through the future. Right, we have, we have our futures ahead of us. Come on in. You're doing great. Come on. <laughs> good, good. Adanya's still in Saudi Arabia or somewhere, so... <laughs> She's off there. So, so this quarter, this quarter, I, it looks like we're going to be spending some time looking at how God, God is with us, because that's the title in the Crucible with Christ, and how that connection, how that connection with God and with Jesus and the Holy Spirit gets us through these really difficult times. Because we all can look back on stuff in life that was really difficult, and and probably in the future, there's going to be some tough stuff. Don't you think? Yes. Yeah, I think there's going to be some really tough stuff happen. And so by, by, by what Bob has already said, by looking back and seeing how God has already led, gives you hope and faith and courage for, for what's coming ahead. So that when something happens, hopefully... You, you already have that foundation and that base, that rock-solid foundation of where you're standing. And that when the storms come, unlike that parable of the man who built his house on the sand, it all fell apart. We've built our house on something really solid, right? So hopefully that's what we're, we're going to look at this quarter. And with a number of different um, verses and texts and places in Scripture that we're going to go for that. But today, today we are, we're in the 23rd Psalm. Isn't that great? So when you're a kid, the first, the first thing you memorized of significance in Scripture was the 23rd Psalm, right? It's the 23rd, almost all of us. That's, I can remember, I don't remember how old I was, but I can remember how proud I was that I could say the 23rd Psalm eventually, right? When you're a kid, how... You memorize those things. Easy to memorize the, the Jesus wept verse. And it's easy to remember John 3, 16, right? But then when you get to the 23rd Psalm, it's a little bit significant. I can remember years ago going to an event at, um, at the um, Astral Pisgah Christian School. And um, there were a group of kids. I think it was, 
I can't remember if, how big the group was, but it was very small, who recited the Psalm 119. And I was just blown away by that, to recite Psalms 119. It's really significant. So, but we all know the 23rd Psalm. And, and, and it's easy to look at Scripture that you know really well, and it's easy to glance over it and to just kind of rush by it instead of taking a little bit of, little bit of time. So that's what I want to do today. Let's take a little bit of time in the 23rd Psalm and see how, see how this, this shepherd in the 23rd Psalm is with us in these crucibles, is with us in these times, and what, what God actually does for us. And how David, inspired, completely inspired by the Holy Spirit, to write this short little passage that is so powerful and so full of hope. If you only knew this passage in Scripture, it would almost be enough. It is really powerful. Are we locked up there? Can you unlock that door back there, Bob? So, so here we are. So here we are. So I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to you to use your powerful minds, use your powerful minds, and as we go through this passage, let's relate it to things in the New Testament. All right? That, that help to connect us with, with things in the, in the New Testament. So, so when, when we first off, then we say, the Lord is my shepherd, what does that immediately make you think about in the New Testament? The lost sheep parable, okay, okay. The lost sheep parable, and how that, how does that relate to the Lord is my shepherd? We're the lost sheep. We're the lost sheep, <laughs> of course. We're the lost sheep, and and again, so so where else? So the, the, the it's a, it's a great passage, the parable of the lost sheep, how God goes out to find that one lost sheep. You know, he's got 99 at the, at the fold, and there's one he's going out to find. That one he's going out to find. And, and we're all that one. Because the 99 are out there in the universe. Right? They're all out there. They're not lost. We're the lost sheep. This little planet's the lost sheep, and Christ comes to find us. Right? What else in the New Testament reminds you of, of the Lord is my shepherd? Any, anywhere specifically that it, that, it, that it says that in the New Testament? In John. In John, okay. John 10, 14. I wrote it down. I am the good shepherd. It says, I am the good shepherd. Remember, he talks about the shepherd and the sheep and the door and getting into the sheepfold and all that. He said, I am the good shepherd. And in 1 Peter, it's there too. 1 Peter 2, now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Right? And Revelation seven seventeen, the lamb will be their shepherd, it says. So we have directly related to, to Psalms 23, Jesus claiming to be this shepherd. Jesus claims to be this shepherd that will come after you and will seek after you and will do all these other amazing things that we're going to find out. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What about that? Isn't that interesting phrase? I shall not want. <clears throat> any, any text in the New Testament that talks about God supplying your needs? My God shall supply all your needs according to, to his, his riches, riches and, glory. and glory in, Christ, in Jesus. Christ Jesus. So we've already established that Jesus is this shepherd, and in Christ he's going to supply all our needs. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places is yours. I think it's interesting, too, when you think about the word needs, uh, it doesn't say he will supply all our wants. Yeah. But if we are in tune with him, our needs and our wants will be in harmony, and then he will supply all our needs yeah. in that level. Yeah, yeah. 
So interestingly, Tensi was, was an extension of the shepherd to that little boy because she supplied what he needed. He actually needed that Bible. Probably needed a watch. And he needed a bike. I don't know that you got him the bike, but, but you got him the watch and the, and the Bible. So, so we can be an extension of this shepherd as well in supplying the needs of others. We can be, we can be providing a provider as well because, because he's already provided everything for you. We have, we have so much. Do you know, do you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to get on a little soapbox right here. Do you know that, that our finances here are remarkable this year? We're way over budget at half the year. It's remarkable. But do you know that it's very easy to give money and it's not easy to give time? And we have great needs. I'm talking to the folks online. We have great needs for people to help with community services and the kids divisions. So if you have extra time, it would be awesome. Spend a little time. It's really easy to give ones and zeros on the computer. That's all it is. It's all the money is, are ones and zeros on a computer somewhere. But it's much more difficult sometimes to give time and to be a provider of time with something like that. So I'm, I'm thrilled that financers are doing so well. I want to be thrilled also about ministry being filled up to overflowing. Well, I think one, and this is backing up just just a little bit to the first Peter uh, chapter two verse. The one thing that really struck me is the guardian of my soul. That to me says so much, the guardian of my soul. What more do we want than Jesus to be the guardian of our soul yeah. while we're here upon earth and when we die? He is still the guardian of our right, soul. Right. I loved that verse. And all throughout eternity. That's right. That's right. Hmm. Hmm. You, um, I had a, have a patient who um, has a very large goat farm up in Madison County. Hundreds and hundreds of goats. And he raises them for meat and he sells them. And I said, how do you keep the... How do you keep the, the predators away? He goes, I have two dogs, two great Pyrenees dogs. Yeah. He said, and they will not let a crow land in that field. <laughs> he said, all night long, they are circling that flock. They both stay awake all night long. In the daytime, he said, one sleeps and the other one stays awake. And they switch off. He said, because they are the guardians of that flock. So when I think of, when I think of that word, Guardian, that's the first image that pops into my mind is someone who never, yeah. never takes his eyes off you. He never gets distracted, never goes away, never wanders off because he's busy with something else. He's the guardian that protects yeah, it, constantly. There's such, there's such a caring to that word, yeah. such a, yeah. uh, an endearing to that word. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a great word, and, and, and that's that image after he told me what those dogs do. And I've heard about Great Pyrenees, but I didn't know they just were so dedicated. Well, donkeys are too. I've heard that too, yeah. Donkeys are too, yeah. And those dogs are not their pets. They don't go out and play ball with them or anything. They feed them and they, you know, take care of them, but, but they don't, they don't, they're not pet, household pets. So... So, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So, what's the first thing he does for you? What does the text say? What's the first thing God got, provides for you? Rest. He makes you lie down. <laughs> He's not driving you somewhere, right? Here's the first thing that God wants to provide, that the shepherd wants to provide for you. Rest. Is there a text in the New Testament that that pops into your minds about, about all this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I, will I will give, give you rest. rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you yeah. and continuing and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you shall find rest for your, for your souls. souls. Yeah. 
Isn't it interesting the creation week because Friday created people and then the Sabbath rested? First thing. The first thing. The first thing is rest. The first thing, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Slow down. Come sit for a while. The first thing this shepherd wants to provide for us is the, is the ability to have, have restoration. To be restored. And you will find rest for yourself. So, <clears throat> makes you lie down beside green pasture. It leads you beside still waters. Lead you beside still waters. Are there any references to waters in the New Testament? Living water. Living water. Okay, good. And he will supply. He supply, supply. And by this he meant the Holy Spirit. Okay, yeah, supply there. the living water. Yeah, good, good. Revelation 22, 1, <clears throat> he takes us to the river of the water of life. Leads us beside still waters, the river of life. <clears throat> and then he restoreth my soul. Verse 3, restores my soul. How does your soul get restored? When you look at the New Testament themes about restoration, how does your soul restored? is fullness of joy and okay. there are various New Testament where Jesus is talking about that your joy may be full Okay. and I think that when we are restored then we can have joy Okay. what needs restoring? everything <laughs> why do we need to be restored? because we're broken because we're broken. <laughs> we're broken how does Jesus restore us? How does, what's the first step in the restoration process? What has he done? What's the first step in the restoration process? Forgiveness. 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 The very first step. The very first step. <clears throat> Galatians 3.13 says he's redeemed us from the curse by becoming the curse for us. Hebrews 9.12, we've obtained eternal redemption through his blood. Colossians 1.13, he rescued us. We have redemption through the forgiveness of sins. And in Ephesians 1.7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So he restores our souls. I'm going to write this up here. Restoration. through his blood or the cross so he's he's our shepherd we're not going to want he may gives us rest he leads us beside still waters so he gets us to slow down he gets us to have be refreshed and then he restores he restores our souls he restores us he gives us this restoration Restoration comes after the rest. It comes after the rest. It comes after the rest. When you, when we went up to, to purchase Nile uh, two or three weeks ago, it was a beautiful day. And when we stood um, and just viewed everything, because there's absolutely gorgeous views up there, there was such a peace. When you stood there and you looked, it was like, everything was right with the world. You, you know it's not, but yeah. it just gives you that feeling of real peace. And so, you know, the rest, he leads us in green meadows beside peaceful streams. That's who he is. Yeah. He's the green meadow. He's the peaceful stream. Yeah. And that gives us the rest so that he can begin to restore everything that is wrong in us yeah. and 
gives us the strength that we need from one thing to the next to the next. Excellent. Verse 3, he restoreth my soul. And the next thing, he, he restores you and then he leads you in paths of righteousness. What does that make you think about? Being led in paths of righteousness. Related to the New Testament. What does that make you think about? When you're I am led. The way, the truth, and the life. I mean, that's a path. Okay. Okay. Good. Lead you in paths of righteousness. What is righteousness? Right paths. Well, it, that would be right paths. He the right you path. In the right in the right path. He leads you in the right path, okay? All right. His namesake. Okay. Bring honor to his name. He leads you in righteousness. He leads you in paths of righteousness. How else are you led in righteousness? Just think for a minute. How else are you led in righteousness? With guidance and protection. Okay, okay, I like that. I like that with guidance and protection. How do you get the guidance in the New Testament? What happens? The Holy Spirit. Don't whisper it. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. <laughs> the, that's a good thing to shout. The Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit comes. So do you see how this prog progression works? We have this restoration happens. And then when the restoration, you're forgiven... You're forgiven. This restoration happens. And then you get led. And you get led by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit leads you in right paths. I like the way you said that. The Holy Spirit leads you in right paths to take you where you should go. And of course we're talking mostly spiritually here about leading you spiritually. There is so much messed up stuff out there. There is so much confusion. People believe all kinds of crazy things with no foundation to, to base it on. And here we have, we have God restoring us and God leading us in paths, in right paths. Restoration and he leads us in right paths. That's what good shepherds do. Good shepherds take their flock in good paths, takes them through tough spots. So, and he does it for his name's sake, like you said. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So, the shepherd is leading. If the shepherd's leading, there will be times in life where it looks like there's going to be a lot of trouble. You think? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, and so, how do we, how do we, knowing this, leads us in paths of righteousness. We're restored. He's leading us in paths of righteousness. He leads. He's the one leading us to rest and to water, to rest restoration, to paths of righteousness. This is all God's doing, right? It's all God's doing. He's moving us along this journey. Moving us along this journey. <clears throat> so, I think this is why our lesson chose this. Because, because chose this passage. Because... The valley of the shadow of death. Um, that's about as bad as it gets, I would think. Do you think? The valley of the shadow of death might be about as bad a situation. Yes. New Testament, the last verse of Matthew, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
So so he's he's never never forsaking he's not, us. He's not going to bail out at the end. Right. Right. He's not going to bail out at the end. Um, but but how does this help you in the valley? Does it help you in the valley knowing that? I just listened this morning to a song by Linda Randall who's with the Bill Gaither. Yeah. And the song that says the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Yeah. The God of the good times is the God of the Yeah, yeah. The light and day. Yeah. So it's the same. That's that's encouraging that the good times or the bad. So, so what does that how does that help you f- in your walk with God knowing that that this is in this chapter that that at times we're going through this valley of the shadow of death at times this is going to look really bad and that you're not forsaken you've not been abandoned how does that what does that do for your thinking about about going through a rough time does it bring you peace okay keeps you going and it, it keeps you going because what is the what does the verse say Yet though I walk through, through the valley. It's not like I'm staying in the valley. Right? I'm walk, gives you, I like that very much. It gives you the, 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 the ability to continue walking through the valley. Knowing he's with you. And knowing that he's with you. Even maybe when it doesn't look like it. That's right. Even maybe when it looks pretty dark. Even when it maybe looks like there's no getting out of this, right? Walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The devotional once that talked about you know, the crucifixion and like if you're ever in those valleys in your life, knowing what was the darkest hour and looking at what was done with that, like that, that's our salvation was in this terrible, terrible. moment. And so when yeah. you're in your valleys going, what can he do with the darkest moment? He can do everything with the darkest yeah. moment. Yeah. So in your yeah. own life, what's he doing through that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and maybe, maybe knowing that, knowing that we're going through, maybe, maybe there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe there's some hope at the end of what we're seeing, despite this, this dark valley. We we. We have this leading through green pastures and still waters. So we, we're, we're starting off in this really nice place, or at least he wants to get us there, leads us to green pastures and still waters. So when you're in the valley, when you're in this valley of the shadow of death, do we give up on the promise that he's going to lead us to green pastures and still waters? earlier we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget forget what's how he's led us in the past Mm -hmm. okay good and it doesn't start off with uh in the darkest valleys it starts off with rest in other words there's a progression here that is taking place before we we really get to our darkest valleys that we go through there's already a foundation that God has laid for his people um, because that it, those dark valleys is when we tend to doubt. It's when we tend to fail. It's when we, our grasp is not as strong and we wonder where God is and why he hasn't answered us or why this has happened to us. And it is also the time that we wonder if we will ever see it through, if right. we will ever get through it. Right. But he's laid foundations before any of this ever happens for us. Yeah. Excellent. I am reminded from what you're saying, years ago I went to a sonship seminar and they one thing they had us do was to do a timeline of our lives and all the high points and the low points and you know just going through that and at the end of that I realized that when I have a new crisis what I look to is not the high points but the low points because those darkest valleys were where I sensed his presence 
the most. more than ever, and it's almost like he flips it. Wow, mm -hmm. wow, wow, wow. Hmm. So now, with what you just said, when you're seeing a dark valley coming. That's right. He was there before. He was there before. So, oh, I like this. So now when you see a dark valley coming and you know in the past that those were times when you felt especially close to God, what should you anticipate? That you're going to feel especially close. That you're going to feel especially close to God. I think also um, in one of Larry Crabb's book, I think it was Finding God, the preface or the in inspire the acknowledgement well int anyway he dedicated that's yes. the word uh, to this man who had cancer and he said that when he was stricken with the cancer he felt the closest to God he had ever felt yeah. in his life yeah. and then he went into remission yeah. and he said that he missed yeah. that, closeness that closeness that he with had God. Yeah. and he prayed that Lord if the only way I can regain that closeness yeah. with you is for the cancer to come back yeah. then so be it and he ended up dying of cancer wow. and I thought when I read that I thought oh my this is way <laughs> <laughs> beyond me but what a what a amazing thought that is yeah yeah that in the worst of times, maybe, maybe the presence of God is the closest. Because I tell you, what happened to the Israelites when things were going good? They, they, they just didn't care about God at all. And when they were struggling and in the pits of despair, they were calling on God. Oh, God, save us. If, if our lives were only cushy and... Never a problem. Maybe we wouldn't need God too much. It makes me think of Psalms 34, 18, where you know, he says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose yes. spirits oh, are crushed. Oh, oh, oh. He's close to the brokenhearted. Right. He's close to the broken. And rescues what? Those who are crushed in spirit. And rescues those who are crushed in spirit. Wow. Wow. They keep going. Yeah. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to rescue each time. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous, not one of them is broken. There you go. That's the key point from today, I think, is that when you're in a rough spot, God's going to come close, mm -hmm. closer than ever. And Job said, I am not silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. And though he slay me, yet will I trust, yet will I trust him. him. Yeah. yeah. And then you think of in Hebrews 12 about the Lord disciplines those he loves. Yeah. And part of that refining process is going through the dark valleys, just combine the metaphors. Yeah. It's to enhance your relationship with him somehow. Yeah. Because if that's the if that's the outcome that God desires to have the the closest relationship with you that he possibly can have. Maybe we should be praying, ooh, this would be a really hard prayer. Maybe we should be praying that, God, whatever you need to do in my life to enhance my relationship with you, I give you permission to do it. That's a scary thing, isn't it? What if we prayed that for our kids? Well, sometimes we do. They'd tell you to stop praying. <laughs> Remember Liversidge? Yes. He, he did that. He was praying. They said, Dad, stop praying for me. <laughs> because they're having all this trouble in their lives. <laughs> because well, we routinely pray, Lord, whatever it takes for your salvation, for us, for our kids, our loved ones, and knowing we can trust him. That, that's, the, that's, the, that's the real real key point of this, knowing that you can trust him. Yeah. That no matter what's happening, he's with you, he's going to be closer than ever, and he's going to enhance your life with his presence. You might not make it out of that sick bed alive. 
but you can trust him that all through eternity, everything is taken care of. And that you'll have the closest, most incredible relationship with God that you, we can't even imagine it. And we get just a taste of it here. Just a taste of it. Bob, you got your hand up. Just made me think of, I think it's Paul that said our troubles are temporary. These temporary, yes, that's such a beautiful verse. These temporary troubles are nothing in comparison to what he's provided for us. Nothing in comparison. That is, I, I need to memorize where that verse is because it's really important. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. It's really powerful. Johnny Erickson one time was quoting that verse and she said, what's this about light and momentary troubles? Yeah. And she said, is God reading in a different dictionary? <laughs> and then she said, and yet, I would not trade my wheelchair and all I have been through for what God has done in my life and yeah, been able to use me as right. a blessing. Right, which would not have happened otherwise, right. probably. Yeah. yeah. She said, of course, I'm looking forward to the new body, but of course. this is what God has yes. used this. Yes, yeah. And just seeing that perspective yeah. helps. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Just briefly, the rod is a masculine noun, and staff is a feminine noun. Isn't that great? Yes, it is. My rod and my staff, your rod and staff comfort me. The masculine and feminine side of God. The rod is the thing that kind of puts you back in place, and the staff is the supply, providing all your needs. Isn't that beautiful? God's going to get us where we need to be, but he's going to provide for us. Exactly. To fight off the enemy. And to fight off the, that's right. And you, it's used to fight off the enemy. And then you, we got three minutes. And then you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You see a big army coming, God says, oh, don't worry about them. Let's eat. <laughs> Let's eat. Right? Well, that's what it says. There's a big enemy out there. Ah, we're going to eat first. Let's, we're going to make big, a big table here. We're going to have a feast. Let's sit down and just, I got this, he says. You got a big enemy out there? Don't worry about it. I got this. Let's eat instead. We've just come through the valley of the shadow of death. I've gotten you through that. Isn't that enough? Can't you trust me now? Let's eat. Pro provides a table for us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our head with oil. It just flows down over us, this blessing of the Holy Spirit covering our lives. He anoints this is what happens when we turn and read the Bible during times like that. That's where our food is. That's where our blessings are. That's where the oil covers us yeah. and anoints us, is in his word when we are in these dark times. And then the oil's covering you, and then your cup is overflowing. What's the purpose of the overflowing cup? To, yes. to give to others. Exactly. You've got so much you can't keep it. Right. It's just going to get all over everybody. Yeah, to share it. Yeah, it's going to get all over everybody. Cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Do you know what that word follow is? Pursue. It's pursue. It's just not like a dog tagging along behind you. No, it's coming after you. God's going to is coming after you all the days of your life. Goodness and mercy shall pursue you all the days of your life. That's what God wants for you. Pursu He's going to pursue you all the days of your life. Won't let you go. And the last thing is, and you'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And you'll dwell So briefly, he leads, he restores, he leads us in paths of righteousness so that we will dwell with him forever. Do you see a little pattern here? Do you see a little pattern here at all? What pattern do you see? Keeps on leading. He does, yes, but what do you see? What do you see? What if we get rid of this? What do you see? 
righteousness. We have restoration, righteousness, and dwelling. What do you see? Salvation. Yes, how do you see it? Not sure. The, uh, I know, I'm being really tough on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we want to see the sanctuary everywhere we look in Scripture. We have the forgiveness. We have the, we, so we have the, the cross of Christ. We have the holy place where righteousness happens. Every day he works in your life to restore you to righteousness. And then we have the most holy place where we're going to dwell with God forever and when he restores us back to his very presence. We have this, look everywhere for the, sanct- for the, you said it right, salvation. You see the salvation story and you see that really clearly in the sanctuary. You're forgiven, he works with you every day and you're, you're, you're brought back to his, to his very presence. God's really amazing in what he's doing. And we've just barely scratched the surface of this psalm. We could spend a whole quarter just on this psalm, which I wish they would have. <laughs> now that I've just done this, it would have been great, huh? Good news. It's good news. And, and I think the key, the key element, what you two brought out, is that when you're in this valley of the shadow of death, that's when you're going to feel the presence of God the most. So, so, looking forward. So this is a big. This is a big thing for me. Looking forward, when when difficult times are ahead that you can see, maybe maybe we can look at it as a time when my relationship, our relationship with God, is going to be enhanced, where we can we can we can draw closer to God and have a deeper, more lasting relationship with Him. Despite the struggle, because if he comes close, if he comes close when you're having trouble, don't we want him to come close? When times are too good, we tend to just wander. When there's a lot of, there's a lot of, all this like sheep have gone astray, right? But he's going to pursue you. He's going to pursue you. Good news. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, what a, what a blessing this short little passage is. And, and like we've said, we've, we've hardly even scratched the surface here. Um, what a blessing you provided to us through the Holy Spirit, through David, to provide one of the most beautiful, beautiful pictures of you we've ever seen. Um, we really would like to be close to you all the time. Um, we really would like that relationship that we have in the tar- tough times to be with us all the time. And you're de- you desire that. We just wander, Lord. Keep us from wandering. Keep us close to you. Keep us focused on you. Keep us in your heart. Keep, us in, keep your thoughts in our minds. Just, just shower us with your Holy Spirit. Anoint us daily with the Holy Spirit. May this oil just flow over us. And may we have so much of you that we can't help but give it to other people around us. Thank you for that. Bless the rest of our Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.